disease. I mean, it's if if you're gonna. I mean, there's already statutes on the books for um, intentional harm. For intentional harm. So you don't need to um, add a special law just for HIV. And um, no other viral condition has laws on the books telling people they can't expose other people to it, including HPV, which kills more people per year, hepatitis C, which kills more people per year, um, only HIV, and that is all about homophobia and racism. Yeah, so, but it is, you're right, I mean, it's, it's a story that makes people kind of uncomfortable to talk about, because, and I think PrEP too, to your point, because uh, it, it's about sex, and it's about pleasure, pleasurable sex, you know, maybe condomless in some instances. And so, um, and that's not been the message that we've been hearing over and over for 30 plus years. And so, but the conversations need to happen. Um, and so, um, I think, and they're starting to happen, but I think we need to see more of it. Kelly, you referred to other things going on in terms of LGBT things, like gay marriage especially, and how so oh, much Oh, yeah, they took all the money and all of the attention, and if you wanted to do anything else, right. That and it also that. kind of puts LGBT people kind of into this box of we all want to go live with a picket fence and only have sex with that one person, you know, as opposed to talking honestly about the kind of sexual lives we really have on the ground. Well, America's not ready for that. I mean, they weren't ready for that when I was at Glad. I think that, like, they did this survey. So they <laughs> Uh, I'm probably going to get sued. But again, um, so, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get sued. So, um, so Arcus like, has like this huge book of like how to, talk to, how to talk to everyone about LGBT issues. And so one of the things that like was on there was like, when we would go into the community and like do media trainings with people, with straight folks about like whatever, and trying to get them to like vote for us. Um, one of the things was don't mention gay sex. It reminds straight people of licking slugs. And that was really something that they told us not to do. Licking, and I was like, are licking, you? Right? Straight people, when you, when, at this time, we were told, don't talk about sex when you're talking about LGBT equality because it makes straight people feel icky. And that's what we were told. And so I think, and this, this is kind of the messaging that was happening at that time, and so when we're talking about HIV, it's all about like semen and blood and needles and secretions. It's all of these like things that freak straight people out. Outside of marriage, outside yeah, of marriage. all of these things are not happening kind of in this like heteronormative way. And I think for a lot of times straight people are okay with gay people as long as I don't have to know what you do. Because you're cute, you know. And I just and I kind of feel like HIV is so not about cuteness and it's so not about that little nice tied up box with like, you know, it's none of those things. And so I think it's been really difficult to get people to write about HIV in a very like way that's honest is because people can't handle it. I mean, I think now we're a lot. I mean, 2009 and 2014 yeah, are so complete. I mean, I never thought like marriage equality was ever going to happen in the way that it is now back in 2008, 2009. I mean, it was just a, and so I feel like we've, we've come a longer, we've come well, a little know, further gotta, in what people you are. You've got to hand it to a lot to. of the PrEP advocates. Y'all know what PrEP is, right? Truvada gives you a, a pill a day, a, one pill a day and you don't get HIV, basically. That's what PrEP is. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, Truvada. But they're also finding now that you don't, maybe you don't have to take it every day, so maybe you took it like before and after. So I think that like prep. Right. But I was going to say this is that I think prep and criminalization are just really hard topics. I mean, they're even hard for me, and I usually don't. I would say I don't really want to write that or I'll write something, but it's not. It's hard. I'm old school. I like a personal story. I like to meet someone who's positive. I like to sit down and talk to them. I like to get their personal story. I like to keep it old school because I think that, and I think it's important to have reported stories about prep and the clinical stuff of it. But I think behind every prep and every pill is a human being putting that pill into their body. And so I think it's always important to make sure we go back to the people. And I think that that's the strength of HIV media. That's always been my favorite thing, whether I was at pause, whether I was in the body wrote a really, really great story for Jeff last year um, on positive women dating. I mean, who wants to read that? Apparently these women want to read that, you know? So I think it's about bringing it back to the actual people who are living the disease. Because at the end of the day, that's what people are going to see. Oh, she's just like my mom. Oh, she's just like, you know, he's just like my dad. They're going to see the similarities. And so always bringing it back to the personal stories is the most important part, I think, of these John, how do you want to say I want to go back to his question for a second because I think this is really um, where advocacy comes in as a journalist. When I 
came, I'm originally from Los Angeles, and I came to Chicago back in 1996 to work um, at the Chicago Reporter, which is an investigative monthly on the focus on race and poverty, and I had the chance to work with Laura Washington. And when you work at the Reporter, it's really um, mission-driven reporting, right? I mean, it's basically advocacy journalism. And what I did when I went to the Tribune after working at the Reporter was I found allies, people that they were editors, copy editors, people in the newsroom that I could pitch stories to because I knew that they were open to them. So when we had to go write about crystal meth and the whole big, even that got screwed up in the mainstream press. But I went, um, I went to a circuit party and wrote this really authentic portrayal of what was going on, for better or for worse. But I had editors backing me up, and I think that's that's the, the other piece of it. Is I don't. It's not this sort of amorphous wall of like they, right? Like it's usually key editors who um, I got told that some of my stories were not safe enough for to be read at the family breakfast table or whatever. It's very Sarah Palin. But the point is, um, but then I had other editors. Some of them were out. Some of them were just more open-minded, and they help me get my stories in. And so I think when we talk about mainstream press, it's really about having allies. It's sort of like you find that reporter who's interested, like I was. Then the reporter, though, has to advocate within the building to make it happen. You know, I was thinking back to the normal heart, and, you know, they have the scene where, um, you know, he goes to the New York Times, he finds the reporter there, um, who is gay but not out, but covers entertainment and other things, not news, but mm -hmm. you, you gotta find people who could be the messengers and who you trust. And I think that's all just relationships and that's advocacy. I mean, all of, the, you know, GLAAD and AFC and, and Gay Men's Health Crisis, all of that's born out of AIDS activism. All of that, that's act up. That's, to me, that's, that's the struggle to be recognized, to be, you know, treated like a human being. And that same kind of advocacy is, that we use on the policy level is what we need in the newsrooms. And sometimes we need it even in our own outlet, where we have, we have to challenge each other to say, well, why aren't we writing about young gay black men and how they're just being devastated by this? Why are we, are we doing enough? You know, what more could we do? And I think Put that, pressure on these other organizations? I mean, I, that's, mean, that's what I'm, When Glad picks up the phone and says, do, 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 Hey, MTV, uh, we need you to do this thing. Uh, it'll be on MTV. I mean, like, I think that these organizations that have this power, because I feel like you can't, not to say that we're like, I just don't think the power can be always placed on us. I think we have to do our job, but I also think that we have to put pressure on Absolutely. organizations like the task force. So even though they do it all, everyone does great work, but I think there has, they have to be the ones to truly recommit now, to HIV. Now, but how does that apply to them?